In today's session, we're going to talk about the connections between vitamin D and sleep quality and sleep duration. There's a lot of really interesting articles and actually clinical studies that are exploring this. And I just wanted to break it down to you because personally, I think this topic is very interesting. Living in Seattle during the winter months, I'm always conscious about getting my vitamin D levels supported through dietary supplements and vacationing when I can to sunny areas and all that. And I know vitamin D insufficiency is quite rampant, particularly if individuals live north of Atlanta, Georgia, between the months of October and March, the zenith angle of the sun is really insufficient to induce cutaneous levels of vitamin D. And so I just want to share with you some of the data as it relates to sleep duration and sleep quality. We know that sleep insufficiency and short sleep duration and poor sleep quality is linked with all sorts of health ailments from exacerbating mild cognitive impairment to uh, mood and depression and anxiety issues, blood sugar dysregulation, uh, appetite uh, in control, uh, leptin issues, uh, insulin resistance. I mean, the list goes on and on. So if we can support your body's vitamin D levels and optimize your sleep as part of that, well, then we can improve a lot of aspects and facets of your life. So I want to share with you the, the science, and this is a really affordable way. Obviously, you can go out if you live in Miami, Florida, or you know Mexico or Costa Rica. You you know have no issues getting vitamin D synthesis by way of your skin and sun exposure. But for those of us that live north of Atlanta, Georgia, we might need to rely upon supplements. We'll talk about dosing and different dosing strategies, possibly using vitamin D supplements later in the day as a means to support sleep duration and sleep quality. So. One of the articles that we're going to talk a lot about, and I'm going to share with you on the screen here, some images about like how vitamin D affects tryptophan, which affects melatonin and serotonin production. And there's vitamin D receptors in the brainstem and all that. Uh, the title here is The Lullaby of the Sun, The Role of Vitamin D in Sleep Disturbance. Now, this is not the first time on this podcast or this channel you've heard about the relationship between vitamin D and sleep. You know that Dr. Stasha Gomenek, we've had her on the podcast twice. She's really uh, talked a lot about this. I'll reference some of those uh, videos and podcasts so that you can re-listen to those should you be more interested. She's also a big fan of supporting the microbiome by way of vitamin D supplementation. Now, we reviewed that about a year ago. Michael Hollick did a study finding that vitamin D actually impacts the diversity of the microbiome, affecting Fecobacterium prasnitzii and Acromenzia mesinophilia and other keystone species that comprise the stability and the diversity of your microbiome. So that's quite interesting. But before we get too deep into the weeds, let's just talk basics like what does vitamin D do? Where do you get it? What's the overall metabolism? Because I, I think it's quite interesting. We'll get into metabolism, overall metabolic health, blood sugar health, and then we'll transition into sleep and finish off with dosing ideas and strategies, things that I've uh, learned over the years by working with medical doctors and hearing feedback going back as early as 2006 with regards to vitamin D supplementation. So we're going to dive into that. But first, friends, I want to welcome you back. Thank you for being here. If you're enjoying this content at any point, you can hit that like button. Be sure to subscribe and just leave a comment below. Also, we're going to talk a lot about vitamin D solutions. I just encourage you to check out our sister company, MyoScience with an X at M-Y-O-X-C-I-E-N-C-E.com. Check out MyoScience. A lot of different vitamin D delivery systems and solutions, and you can use the coupon code podcast at checkout. I will link all of that below. Kids really enjoy the vitamin D gummies. These are amazing because, as we're going to talk about, vitamin D receptors are found throughout the brain. Really important for developmental health. So you should be supporting your family's vitamin D levels. There's a ton of research here. Preconception vitamin D uh, for new neonates and newborns and, and toddlers and all that. Vitamin D, really important. Kids are not getting sufficient vitamin D. So check out the vitamin D gummies. There's liquid as well. So let's dive into it. So vitamin D is a pro-hormone that impacts sleep quality and sleep duration. There's vitamin D receptors and they co-localize with this retinoic acid receptor. There's a lot of complex stuff, but how does it get made in your skin? So there's a, a derivative of cholesterol called 7-dihydrocholesterol. When you get sunlight, UVB radiation in the wavelength form between 280 and 315 nanometers. By the way, there's a new at-home uh, kit that you can use to synthesize vitamin D at home. More on that on another day. But anyway, that 7-dihydrocholesterol that seven seven is converted into pre-vitamin D and then vitamin D. So this is also where vitamin D supplements come straight in. So you don't have to take that 7-dihydrocholesterol into the pre-vitamin D, into the vitamin D. Then vitamin D is hydroxylated by your liver, and it can be further hydroxylated by your kidneys into 125-dihydroxyvitamin D. So when you test your blood levels, what you're testing is 25-hydroxyvitamin D. So that's after it's either made 
through the cholesterol, uh, dihydrocholesterol, seven dihydrocholesterol, or the dietary supplements, and that all that conversion synthesizes and your, after your liver converts it into seven hydroxy vitamin D. That's what you're testing on your blood levels. Okay. Now, what are the factors that impact vitamin D? levels and cause this rampant vitamin D insufficiency. Well, we know that latitude, we know that altitude, we also know that seasonality impacts this, also age. Younger people make more vitamin D through way of cutaneous synthesis than do older people. We know that skin color, race, ethnicity, the darker your skin, the more melanin in your, in your skin, the less UVB induced cutaneous synthesis you have of vitamin D. So that plays a, a big role there as well. Use of sunscreen. So many people say, well, I go outside, you know, I'm outside, but you, you see what they do beforehand. They're covering up. They're afraid of skin wrinkles, skin cancer, the whole thing. So they're covering up their skin, their face, their their uh, eyes and all that, plus you're using sunscreen. So I encourage you to just use, you know, about 20 minutes of, if you can, you know, during the spring, summer and fall, 20 minutes of full body sun exposure, then apply the sunscreen or the covering. So I get that, get that vitamin D going. So deficiency of 25 hydroxy vitamin D is defined as blood levels uh, under 20 na 29 nanograms per ml. So between 21 and 29 na nanograms per ml. I will tell you, after working in a clinic that ran vitamin D on tens of thousands of patients over the years. Now I'll tell you, it's really common. If, if people are not really into the healthy living concept, it's often that their vitamin D levels are quite low. I've seen levels as low as six nanograms per ml, okay? My levels last time I tested, you know, I'm experimenting with supplements all the time. You know, we we're, we take vitamin D seriously in our household. My levels got a little bit too high, 126 nanograms per ml. So I'm just taking a break for a few weeks. Okay, now, when it's in your body, when your vitamin D is circulating and so forth throughout your your, your body, we, we kind of relegate the physiology into classical pathways versus non-classical pathways. So if we think about the classical pathways of vitamin D, it's involved in calcium homeostasis and you know the, the whole parathyroid and calcium regulation, phosphorus and all that. But there's a lot of emerging over the last, I'd say 15 years, non-classical pathways that are linked with vitamin D and the vitamin D receptor. Today, we're going to focus on sleep, but I just want to let you know because metabolism is really important, blood sugar health, insulin sensitivity. These are associated or characterized in the non-classical pathways linked with vitamin D. So uh, it's involved in, in mostly cardiometabolic and immune pathways, I would suggest. So here's a direct quote from the paper. While vitamin D has traditionally been shown to be involved in calcium homeostasis and bone health, as I was just describing, recent evidence suggests that extraskeletal effects are profound. Uh, inadequate levels of vitamin D has been linked to a number of diseases, including metabolic disorders, psychiatric, respiratory, and cardiovascular disorders, autoimmune conditions, and cancers, as well as osteoporosis and osteomalacia. Uh, the widespread systemic effects of vitamin D have been attributed to the ubiquitous expression of vitamin D receptors in various organs, and as we're going to talk about the brain stem and various brain regions that regulate sleep duration and sleep quality. Really important stuff. So just a few studies here. The um, Anaheim study, which is the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey that's been going on forever. Um, they found that low vitamin D levels were linked uh, with shorter sleep duration. So that's really important. There's another study in over 100 adults that found a significant independent and inverse relationship between 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels and apnea hypothesis apnea index. This is the sleep apnea index, uh, as well as heart rate and heart rate variability. These are all cardiovascular risk factors. So really interesting stuff for people that have sleep disorder breathing and or sleep apnea. So think big belly, big neck, uh, individuals who are mouth breathers, they should really consider vitamin D. And it, the direction of causality is not totally sussed out, but it's interesting to, to figure out and, and know that well, maybe possibly improving vitamin D could help in these individuals. So let's now focus specifically on vitamin D and sleep. I think this is important and there's data, new data that you should know about. So specifically when it comes to sleep, vitamin D impacts brain regions involved in sleep regulation and sleep-wake cycles. The exact mechanisms by which vitamin D affects and regulates these sleep uh, mechanistic pathways is unclear, although it has been suggested that there are some areas within the brainstem specifically wherein vitamin D impacts. So several studies have found a positive association between low vitamin D levels and short sleep duration. There's a researcher in China, Huang et al., found improvements in sleep duration of about 45 minutes in a prospective study of a group of patients that supplemented with vitamin D, and the dosage was actually custom tailored to improve their levels. So based upon where their levels were at, they would give been given like a thousand IUs or 2000 or 4000. 
So that's pretty interesting. But think about that. What would you do for a 45 extra minutes of sleep per day? I mean, that's pretty profound. That can be the difference between a good day and a crappy day. So just think about that. Now, when you think about the cost of vitamin D for a month's supply, it's about $12, friends. So imagine you're like, well, oh, I don't have the money to do all this. You're like, you don't have $12 a month to get an extra 45 minutes every night of sleep, potentially, if your vitamin D levels are low, or if you live north of Atlanta, Georgia. Come on, this is a really uh, interesting piece of low-hanging fruit. So they go on to say that given that sunlight drives both vitamin D synthesis and circadian rhythms, it is possible that vitamin D is involved in the transduction of light signals that regulate circadian rhythms. So it may be impossible to disentangle the effects of vitamin D from circadian biology. And that's what's important. So as we finish off here and talk about dosing, consider potentially later in the afternoon or evening or before bed for dosing. And I will say anecdotally, working in a clinic with Dr. Gerard Guillory, he practices outside of Denver, Colorado. He's measured vitamin D levels and has been measuring this since 2006 on so many patients, probably at this point, 15, 20,000, I'm not sure. At the time that I worked with him back in 2007, he was already, had already tested over 4,000 patients. And we did some small little studies with the Aurora Fire Department where we randomized people to get 4,000 IUs of vitamin D versus not. And some interesting things happened when they all went on a, a cruise ship, actually, on their vacation. The vitamin D group uh, didn't get sick and the other group did. And it was really interesting. We did this. It was unpublished, but it was just an observational study. And we were trying to promote um, the, the benefits of vitamin D for just overall health and well-being in a group of really active, physically active people, you know, firemen. You know, they uh, have a really flexible schedule. A lot of them have different jobs or they choose that profession uh, so that they can go out and play on the days that they're not working. So they'll work like two days on, four days off or uh, 48, four. They, they, there's a lot of different schedules that they do. And again, they like that profession because it gives them time to be outside. But what's, what was interesting, and even in the state of Colorado, which if you don't know, Colorado gets on average 300 sunny days per year. It's fairly south. You know, it's north of Atlanta, but it's it's definitely further south than Seattle or Minnesota, right, in Minneapolis. Well, guess what? There was a lot of vitamin D insufficiency in this population. So a lot of them were on four to, to 6,000 IUs of vitamin D per day. So let's get on and talk a little bit more about how vitamin D impacts specific neurotransmitters. This was new to me, the relationship between vitamin D impacting uh, GABA synthesis, and so it, it affects all these brain regions like we've been talking about, but also sensitivity to neurotransmitters as well as to neurotransmitter receptors such as GABA and the NMDA receptor. Vitamin D also regulates tryptophan conversion uh, to 5-HTP, which goes on to make serotonin and also melatonin. And so I think that's quite interesting, but let's finish off on brain development since we're on this conversation of sleep, you know, that the, the brain regulates sleep and sleep duration and sleep quality and sleep cycles and all that. But it, as I was sharing with you earlier, with your children, vitamin D is really important because it impacts brain development and the synthesis of neurotrophins are impacted by vitamin D. So uh, there's various neurotrophins and neuro neuronal growth factors such as neurotrophin 3 and glial cell line derived neurotrophic factor GDNF. I've never heard of that. I've heard of BDNF and I know you've heard of that. Intermittent fasting, exercise, reading books, uh, playing an instrument, learning a new language, all of these things impact BDNF. Well, there's related uh, neurotrophic growth factors, and it turns out that vitamin D impacts these growth factors. So again, really important for moms that are trying to conceive, trying to have a baby, uh, moms that are pregnant, moms that are breastfeeding, and also your, your children, support your body's vitamin D levels. I will tell you that you know, the last time I looked at the RDA for um, you know, toddlers and infants, it's like 400 IUs, which probably is insufficient, especially because you know, new moms uh, are really overly cautious about protecting babies from the sun. So it's almost like babies get no sunlight. Um, you know, they're covered, their skin uh, has, I, I remember just, I see babies all the time, I'm sure you do too, where their skin is just completely white. You know, they're just doused in sunscreen. Well, if you're only giving them like less than 400 IUs of vitamin D and you're dousing them in sunscreen, uh, and mom's not, you know, supplementing from breast milk, where's the, the newborn going to get vitamin D? And as you just heard, there's a lot of different growth factors within the brain that are influenced by vitamin D. So really important. Uh, and so the scientists go on to say, therefore, through multiple loops, vitamin D can potentially affect development, maintenance, and survival of neurons. Uh, moreover, hypothetically low levels of vitamin D during early life could be relevant for future development of several brain diseases, such as schizophrenia and multiple sclerosis. So really important stuff. In fact, there's been some data finding that people that are 
born and live during the first part of their life in northern latitudes are at increasingly higher risk for developing multiple sclerosis. And it could be due to this new mechanism by which vitamin D impacts these neurotrophins and growth factors. So what's the big picture? Obviously, vitamin D impacts various aspects of metabolism, of immunity, of musculoskeletal bone health, but also brain development and sleep duration and sleep quality. That study from China actually found that by optimizing vitamin D levels, you they found in this study, again, individuals can get a up to a 45-minute add-on in terms of total sleep duration, which is quite amazing. So we know that sleep quality and sleep duration go hand in hand and vitamin D insufficiency is correlated. We don't know the direction of causality with poor sleep quality and poor sleep duration. So get your vitamin D levels optimized. You can test your vitamin D levels, go to your doctor. If you haven't had blood work or you can't afford it, you don't have insurance, you can do a blood spot levels. We actually can offer that over at Myo Science. You can check that out. It's a vitamin D blood spot. It's $45, really affordable, and you can just test your levels. If you don't like venipuncture, you don't like needles, this is a great way just to start to see where your levels are at, to see if you even if supplementation is warranted. Some people that are super active, maybe they don't need it, but I find that a lot of people are not, they don't have quite the levels that you would want to strive for. Now, what most of the data shows in this environment, immunologically speaking, having levels around 60 nanograms per ml is kind of the, the high end of normal, right? That's where you might get, you might not get as, you know, diminishing returns after that and under that may not be as protective. So if you can aim around 60 nanograms per ml, most of the science finds that to be pretty effective. Now, how do you get there? Well, you know, for some people that are overweight or darker skin, they might need to use 10,000 IUs together. For other people, it's 5,000 IUs, right? So you're going to have to tinker with this, and that's why I recommend testing. So I'll link below some of the tests and some of the resources for that. Now let's talk about timing. What about when you take your vitamin D levels? To be honest, it probably doesn't really matter much. I mean, as long as you get your levels up, you're probably okay. If you want to split hairs and you haven't yet tried evening or late afternoon dosing and you have sleep issues, you might want to try dosing your vitamin D during that time. I mean, what's the worst thing that can happen? You get no benefit in terms of sleep improvement or it helps, right? It's unlikely that it's going to worsen your sleep. I've, I've never heard that from anyone. Um, so just keep that in mind. So if you're like, well, yeah, well, I might as well focus on sleep, dose your vitamin D with dinner or do it in the, take it in the evening. Now, can you take vitamin D on an empty stomach? Well, ideally, because it is a fat-soluble vitamin, uh, you would take it with fat. Now, if you forget, it's probably incrementally reduced in terms of absorption, probably still getting some benefit. So if you forget, take it anyway, but try to take it with food. So now you might be wondering, well, what about vitamin D with vitamin A? What about with vitamin K? You know, to be honest, I found people just taking vitamin D as a standalone, get a lot of benefits. I'm a huge fan of vitamin K because many people are not getting fermented foods and natto and things like that in their diet. So I do recommend vitamin K. Vitamin K is important for helping to make sure calcium is going where it should be going into the bone and the hard tissues, not into the soft tissues in the body. So vitamin K is a little bit more expensive. So when you're throwing it in there, it does add a little cost. And I'm a fan of the MK7 form of vitamin K2. Uh, that is made from fermentation from bacillus coagulans. And so that's a, a, a really cool, interesting way to go about it. Uh, our sister company, Myoscience, we've worked with an Italian biotech company that makes this fermented from bacillus coagulans. And um, yeah, so that's a really interesting way to go about that. Now, what about your kids? I find with kids, uh, the most affordable way to go about this is with liquids or with gummies. So that's going to be the easiest thing. Bar, bar none, liquids are the most affordable. Um, so you can buy basically one bottle every six months. So your cost is really, really low on that. And you can just, your kids and your your family, if your spouse doesn't like vitamin D, you can just pour it in a coffee, they'll never know. So friends, that's it for today. I hope you found this helpful. Again, the title of the paper that I learned so much from that I think you might like to, to read is called The Lullaby of the Sun, The Role of Vitamin D in Sleep Disturbance. Definitely check this out and check out the interviews with Dr. Stasha Gomenek. She's been talking about this a lot. Really important stuff, really affordable, really accessible. So strive to optimize your body's vitamin D levels. Of course, you wanna get sun exposure irrespective of the season. I mean, in the winter, you want to get out there because it helps to entrain your body's circadian clock. Even on a cloudy, rainy day, please get outside. It's really important. And try to minimize the lights and the artificial light after sunset and after dark. So thanks for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed it. We will catch you on a future episode down the road. Bye now. Yeah.